Do you have a favorite book or perhaps a story, one that your parents used to tell you when you were little? Mine is about my middle name. The best time to have a child is September. It's that time between summer and fall when it's not too hot or too cold, and you can see the senses are still orange with a light pink. All the women in the town knew this. That's when she found out she was pregnant. She realized her baby wasn't going to be perfect. She counted down the months in her pocket-sized calendar and realized her baby was going to be born in March. She knew marriage wasn't an option and that would only bring more bad luck to the baby. Her family didn't talk to her, not even when she asked for her name. She spent two days in the hospital and her baby didn't want to come out. It was windy out and the wind always carries secrets. She was afraid the wind was going to take her baby away, so she prayed and prayed to all the saints until one of them listened. She had a beautiful girl with brown eyes and curly hair. When her family came to visit, they all realized she looked like a September baby. This was a blessing. Who would have thought that a single mother could have a child with curly hair? They all tried to pick the name, but she decided to name her Marisol. Sea and sun, bright like el maíz and strong like her faith. Storytelling comes in different shapes. You can have visual storytelling, oral storytelling, written storytelling, but today I'm going to talk about literature, specifically about fiction. So why fiction? In a world where we see horrendous things like white supremacy, colonialism, capitalism, it's so easy to lose hope and faith. Fiction gives us the ability to dream, and just this work is about dreaming. It's about believing and working towards a better world and always believing that it is possible. Before we go any farther, I have a disclaimer, because all the work of fiction I'll be mentioning today are by Latinas. The reason that is is because I'll be talking about my own journey and experience, and I wanted books that will relate to my identity. However, I want to honor authors such as Octavia Butler, Linda Huckman, Isabel Allende, and so many other women of color who have devoted their lives to write and imagine and fight for justice. Their words also inspired this talk. So what is the difference between reality and fiction? And I believe they both work together to create a bigger truth. The difference is who gets to tell the story. I always felt hesitant about telling my own story because people want me to talk on behalf of my entire community or will tokenize my experience. But I realized that those that truly listen to me are the ones that need my story the most. So I hope today you all get to travel with me. The first book I'm going to talk about is The House of Mango Street. Personally, I've always been obsessed with the idea of names and belonging just like the protagonist of the book, Esperanza. She says, in English, my name means hope, and Spanish means too many letters. I could tell from the beginning <laughs> that she did not feel comfortable in the house she was living with her family and her own skin, and I could relate to this feeling so well. Since I moved to the United States when I was 15 years old, I've been feeling out of place. In my high school, no one really looked like me or sounded like me. So when this book found me in my junior year, I hold on to it so hard because it made me feel less alone. So while other people were trying to write essays, this is my only true friend. <laughs> and then eventually, I asked the question, who gets to decide where you belong? You see, there is a lot of power in language, especially when people get to call you names and call you foreign. So I started reading more. I started imagining more. I wrote the story about La Niña del Maíz because I wanted to imagine that I had a connection to the place I grew up, see where I come from, where people of corn. And even though I never planted anything in my life or grew anything, I still wanted to feel a deep connection to my roots. I wanted to feel proud to be the child of a single mother. And I wanted to share my story with others. Recently, in my current job, I got invited to do a presentation about storytelling. And I told the same, this same exact story about how I moved to this country, about not belonging. At the end of the presentation, one of the students came up to me and said, you know, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one who felt like I didn't fail. I realized that I built a home with my words, 
And in that moment, that student became the first guest in my home. This is a picture of me when I met Sandra Cisneros. I was fangirling hardcore, and my hearts weren't sweating, and I was just so excited, like the nerd I am. So after a lot of Sandra's books, I finally graduated high school and I got accepted to college. I was the first one in my family to get admitted to an American institution. I came here to Western Washington University and I actually graduated this past June. But when I first... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, but when I first came, my ego was so big, it would have no fit in this entire room. <laughs> Hard to believe. And so this created a huge disconnection between my family and I, because no one in my family have ever attended college. So the longer I stayed in this institution, the larger the gap between my family and I grew. I have a beautiful mentor who would always ask, for what and for whom are you doing this work? Why are you in college? This question still haunts me to this day. And then I came across this book, Como Agua para Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. The main plot of the book is a love story between Pedro and Tita de la Garza. But the beauty about it is that it gets, it gets told through food. So each chapter is a different recipe that Tita created. As soon as I opened this book, I started thinking about my abuelita, who knows the world through the kitchen, and thought about her own abuelita who taught her how to cook. Generations of women that have kept my family together. And that is something that you don't learn in any school. When I was reading this book, I wrote, Can dreams grow roots? Because those of us who are able to tell our stories, our ancestors' dreams come true. And I believe that it was generational knowledge is what got me here. My abuelita knowledge through the food. Because you see, this book made me realize that there is a huge difference between schooling and education. You wouldn't believe how many people I met at Western that had a PhD but did not have an education. They didn't have a consciousness. <laughs> they did not have a consciousness on why they were to school, a connection to who they were or their communities. You see kids getting told, go to school so you don't have to be like your family is one of the most contradictory things I've ever heard. Families like mine, immigrant with no degree, working over 50 hours a week, they do it because they have to survive. And it was their survival what got me here. And now I'm standing talking about dreaming and giving a speech about literature. <laughs> So now imagine if you turn to your grandparents and your elders and ask them, what are the stories and knowledge that you shoulder hold? And trust me, we will be able to fill thousands of thousands of books with all the stories, and perhaps in there we will find out for what and for whom we're fighting for justice. So I know I use a lot of words in Spanish, and that's because that's my first language, so I think primarily in Spanish. Um, but when I was learning English, one of my ultimate goals was to get rid of my accent. And the reason that was because a lot of people felt entitled to come up to me and ask me, you know, like, why are you here? And have you ever been asked, but where are you really from? Well, I get that question pretty often. And the worst or best part is that I actually am from Mexico, so like, yeah, I'm from Mexico, and their face is like, of course you are. And <laughs> so I am a loud Latina who wears flowers and has an accent, so I'm basically a walking stereotype. <laughs> and I wish those people who feel entitled to ask me why I'm here would also ask me and rephrase the question, what are the historical and political factors that displace you from a homeland? Then that would be an interesting conversation. But going back to my accent, um, so when I was learning English, that one of the first books I read was How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent by Julia Alvarez. And I was so excited because I was like, this is a how-to guide. Like, there goes my accent, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 
finally fitting in. Um, I was very wrong. Um, <laughs> the story is actually about four sisters who moved from the Dominican Republic to the United States. And it starts when they're adults, and it goes back to when they're ch children. And it was so interesting to read it, because in each page, I could see how Americanized they were becoming, how they were forgetting their roots and why they moved here. This was a reflection of historical assimilation and displacement. But it was also the first novel where I learned about the Dominican Republic's regime. So in 15 years of my schooling, never had I ever heard about it before. So I'm going to take a quick pause, because how much of this was fiction and reality? I'm guessing a lot of you have heard the legend of Christopher Columbus. So this guy with no very special talent claimed that, quote unquote, he discovered a whole continent when there was already people here with civilizations, cultures, and costumes. And we have come to believe this lie that we're still teaching in our schools. And this is a picture from an actual textbook. Excuse me, but I don't recall any indigenous peoples actually giving up their land. So what this book reminded me was that we need to humanize history. This book told a perspective, a personal perspective or a historical account, and it completely changed my mind about how history gets told. Who gets to write history, to print it, to distribute it? What is the historical truth? So I realized that holding to my accent was a reminder of why I got displaced from my country. I realized that this accent reminded me that the reasons leaving my homeland behind were stronger than the American dream. So we need to keep telling our stories, even if they're as simple as telling our names, because they keep our histories alive. So I know I've been talking a lot about reading, but it is also a matter of writing. And I personally consider myself a writer, but every time I'm going to start a new piece, I think, why does this story matter? Where were my words reached? I've lost the count of number of books I've read about people who live in between borders, people with problems with language, and I say, why would this matter? Then I think about my 16-year-old self sitting in a classroom, feeling by herself, and opening the house on Mango Street, and realizing she wasn't alone. And I think we write not only for ourselves, but to create solidarity, to fight commonality in each other's struggles. We write, as Esperanza would say, for those who can't know out. Storytelling is one of the oldest forms of preserving our history. When books reflect the reality we live in, they give us the ability to dream. And let me tell you, a person of color who dreams is dangerous. Dreaming, we're able to create the tools we need to fight for justice. We're able to name the pain that we and our families carry. Our stories are able to set us and others free. So now more than ever, I invite you to keep writing Keep imagining, inventing words, and always, always imagine that a better world is possible. Thank you.